for those of you who don't know, uh, actually, let me start off with me. I don't want to start with Chris because nobody knows me. I haven't introduced myself. So I'll take two seconds to do that. Uh, my name is Dennis Schultz. I am the New York City chapter president for Blacks in Technology. Uh, if you're not familiar with Blacks in Technology, we are a national nonprofit organization who advocates for, you guessed it, Blacks in Technology. <laughs> So if you aren't a member and you want to find more information, uh, you can always visit our website. Is The local chapter is bitnyc.org, or you can visit blacksintechnology.net, get a bunch of information there, or just reach out to me um, as the coordinator. I'll put my contact information in chat. About Chris. So Chris, I've known since 2018, or I met in 2018, he was speaking at a Blacks and Technology conference where we first crossed paths. And um, I knew that I was going to figure out a way to work with him, excuse me, one way or another, because he was a very sharp guy. And I was thinking, I got to use this guy somehow. So <laughs> we, um, we came up with um, the virtual um, webinar. And I believe it's going to be very timely, especially now since... Um, the pandemic is upon us and everybody's figuring out ways to work and live differently. Uh, just a little bit about Chris. Uh, he is based in Silicon Valley. He's a national and international speaker uh, with expertise in med tech, echo tech, education, virtual, and augmented, and mixed reality, artificial intelligence, telepresence, disruptive media, <laughs> and several other applied sciences. Uh, founder of XR platforms, Flotella, um, Halo Practice, and the Immersive Directory. He's creating a series of immersive medical incubator platforms, building fully equipped immersive holodecks and creating emerging technology applications and hardware. Uh, Chris, I'll let you go into anything else you wanna tell the folks about yourself, but with that, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dennis, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your sentiments and your introductions. Hello, everyone, um, I'm happy to see that Many of you have had the opportunity to come out to attend uh, and to visit with one another uh, in a sense of community in these contemporary times uh, that we're looking at. Um, I want to definitely doff my hat to Blacks and Tech. I think it's an absolutely necessary uh, and a wonderful organization to be part of the techno technological sphere um, in what we're doing. Um, it's far too prevalent right now uh, in the hour of emerging technology, not to have um, not just organizations such as Blacks and Tag, but there's so many other organizations that are out there uh, that are needed and necessary for people that don't have uh, those to help represent them. So when you start thinking about representation, and when I think about representation in groups, specifically under the banner of technology, uh, Blacks in Technology is just about at the top of the list. And there's dozens of other organizations that I'm affiliated with, uh, but I certainly do have an, 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 an an alignment with Flax and Tech uh, for all that they do in their leadership. And so when I was asked to speak um, on the subject of XR, I was happy to, uh, to do so and to do such. And so today what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be touching on the current and future state of XR um, with a little bit of dab of where we've been and where we're at and then where we're going. And we're not gonna go too far where we're going uh, because I think it's vitally and critically important for us to maximize whatever time that we can uh, in this first half of this session to touch on things that I think are more prevalent and necessary for what's happening uh, today in the space of XR uh, and subsequent uh, technologies as well. So I'm going to jump into this presentation and then we're going to save some time uh, definitely for others to be able to chime in and to be able to kick in as well for Q&A. And so bear with me as I get this set. Get my screen on, get this rock and roll, three, two, one, boom. Get over here, get into this presentation, flip you guys right side up, and here we go. So, right now, we're starting the current and future state of XR. I hope that everyone can hear me. Great. So, May 13th, 2020, and one of the things that we have to look at is what is XR? Well, XR is not just virtual and reality and augmented reality. A lot of people will look at it as that, and I know a lot of my peers in the industry classify it specifically towards virtual and augmented reality, but really XR is extended reality. 
And though it's part of a reality of systems, you can also include such technologies as Zoom and Hangouts and Blue Jeans and so forth and so on. In fact, if you listen to the dialogue of what's been happening in the world as of late, you've probably heard the more, word more virtual uh, in the last two months than you probably have in the last two decades. And so when we talk about virtual, it's virtual communication of people being able to communicate <clears throat> one to another, if you will. And at the same time, it's not limited to the confines of just a digital or being immersed into a digital construct in a 3D environment. So without 3D, <clears throat> you can't have 2D and 1D. In other words, you have 1D, 2D, and then you have a natural progression of what we're looking at in technology. Today, we're gonna to be covering the brief history of XR, the current state of XR 2020, significant obstacles, the culture, safety, and accessibility, which is key, and then a future state of emerging technologies one to two years out. Uh, typically, I usually go five to 10 years out, but again, to take advantage of the time and opportunity and to have a more re realistic scope. Because look, even if you had projections at the end of February, a lot of those projections, not just in XR, but in technology as a whole, are being blown out the water. Why? Because we all know why, with what's happening in the world right now. And we're gonna to touch on a lot of that here in just a little bit. But for now, we're gonna to go to the brief history of XR. One of the things that I've heard in coming up in Silicon Valley and learning from a lot of the people that I've learned and some of the pioneers that have been developing and building this content, both men and women, um, when we talk about XR technology, a lot of people tend to think that it's a new technology. Um, for us in the space and us that build in the space, we haven't done the best job in actually communicating, conveying what this technology actually is. Because if you go to somebody now and ask them, what is virtual reality? A lot of people think that virtual reality is a 90s video game if you go and ask them. So when we talk about XR technology, the first thing we want to make sure that people know is that it's not new. It's been envisioned by mankind since the 1800s. And technically we can go further than that, but for now we'll go from the 1800s and move our way all the way up to 2020 contemporary. The 1800s to the 1950s is the visionary generation. We're looking at stereoscopic technology where you can see different types of the same type of image in your left eye and your right eye. Uh, Vajmelion spectacles. Uh, a really well-known sci-fi or maybe not so well-known sci-fi book that spoke to someone being able to have on a headset and to be able to feel, touch, taste using that headset. That was VR. But of course, when you start looking at all the way to the 1800s and 1950s, someone might ask, well, how become is now becoming more prevalent now today? Well, a lot of that has to do with power. Without power, you can't have technology. The more power that you have, the greater technology that you'll see and that you'll see being developed. Now we move on to the 1960s and the 1980s, the prototype generation. Technology such as the telesphere mask and the virtual interface environment workstation, which was actually made and built and developed by NASA. I know we're thinking NASA is somewhere up in the sun, moon, and stars, and Mars and Jupiter, the solar systems, and all these other places, but NASA actually does build often constructs and projects that have to do with where we're at here on the ground on planet Earth. And so one of the things in some of, one of the major research uh, organizations such as NASA Ames here in Silicon Valley and Mountain View, and they were dabbing and they were building and prototyping all the way back in the 80s when it came to virtual reality. Some of the very first headsets were developed in the 80s itself by men and women because there's a misnomer, and I put an emphasis on there that this is an all male built um, platform and society going forward and that's what the pioneer construct of what people believe looks like but that's just simply not the case and it's also simply not the case that it was completely built uh, for white homogenous uh, uh, vessels believe it or not there are many people of color that have been contributing uh, colors of community that have been contributing to the development and the construct of this type of technology um, even though it's not often mentioned it's so anyhow so when they had the prototype generation, we weren't really going to market with this. We weren't going to a consumer market and we weren't going to enterprise market. But nonetheless, it was still being intentionalized because now we started to have power. I mean, you saw video game systems start to come into play and if you why, because graphics were up, animations were up, capabilities were up, consumer pipelines were being developed and built out. Now, when we move into the 90s, 
to the 2000s, now you have what we call the enterprise experimental generation. Now you have go-to-market platforms, you saw a lot of things happening, some things happening in clinical VR, and you saw a considerable amount of military adoption, unlike what you see today, that was considerable for the technology that was so on the edge uh, that people were so unsure of what exactly this is for and what it does. During the prototype generation, we had to nail down the hardware and then the visual in terms of content. But in the 90s, we started to see some type of adoption, but most, the majority of the adoption that was happening in the 90s fell flat. There was a lot of failed data, but a lot of that, uh, if you look at it, you consider um, the trough of disillusionment of what we talk about, uh, Garner's hype cycle, um, there's peak of inflated expectations, but then all of those, uh, for the very most part, went down into the trough of disillusionment, and we come to find out that we're years away. Why? Because the hardware ready, wasn't ready, the power wasn't ready, society wasn't ready. I mean, people are still trying to wrap their minds around what a Sega Genesis was. So when you start to think about taking them to a higher initiative, uh, such as uh, XR, if you will, and bring them into a third dimension. Uh, if you look at what we're happening, uh, what we're experiencing right now when it comes to Zoom, a lot of people haven't even wrapped their minds around that. You literally have gone from 10 million to 200 million users in Zoom, and people still haven't wrapped their mind around that. I know a lot of people say virtual reality is here, it's a ride, COVID-19 has ushered in a new generation, so and not so but we'll touch on that in just a little bit as well. Really important things to discuss. Moving forward, so we, now we go into the 2000s to 2010s, which is the enterprise and consumer mesh early adoption generation. This is where we're at right now, contemporary to our time. We've had some major, major significant updates in the world of XR. We find platforms such as Unity game engines, and Unreal game engines that helps creatives and developers and designers to create 3D assets and to create design interfaces unlike anything you've ever seen before. You have companies such as Apple that releases that release AR Kit. You have companies such as Google that release AR Core for augmented reality, which is a really big deal. Now this is giving developers and creatives accessibility to be able to design for platforms that are mostly widely used all around the world when it comes to mobile device. That's significant. When people ask me often about AR and VR and which way the direction that they should go in, I have a lot of answers for that and we'll touch on that. And then you have scaled HMD distribution. 2010, the Oculus started poking its head off the water and saying, hey, here we are, the new headset, which HMD stands for head mounted display. That's what you commonly hear and when you see things like the Oculus Quest or you hear of other platforms such as the Vive. And that's virtual reality, which is a full enclosure immersive simulation environment that you can be able to operate from your home or for an office or any given place where you have such access to, to do what you want to do with that particular device. Now, the HMDs, there's been dozens that have already come to market and there's been dozens that have already failed. But the fail data has suggested that people still have a demand for it. There's still a want for that and that other people have taken the other failures of what people have done and taken that and obviously married that up to some type of success. But we still have a long ways to go on that. Why do I say that? Well, one of the things that we must consider is when we look at XR in terms of virtual reality specific, though it be good for the time now present, it's not completely ready. It's just not. I know a lot of people, especially over the last several months, and since VR is absolutely here. VR has only just arrived in the womb. We've just now developed sight. But when you think about virtual reality, virtual reality is not a single variable equation, it's multivariate. That means we must consider when we're dealing with VR, sight, taste, touch, haptical touch, sound, spatial resonance, and more importantly, spaces in which we operate and when we want to be able to enjoy virtual reality. Right now, the best of what we've developed is sight. Now, is that to say that virtual reality isn't ready, is it good to go to market? It absolutely is. But it's still limited, and it's certainly not the whole pie. But the slice that we have to offer and that's being offered out is quite tasty, and I'll have more of that if I can. So that's what we're looking at when it comes to virtual reality. We'll touch on some more of that here soon. Moving forward, now we're touching on to augmented reality. 
in this chart that goes roughly 1968 to 2017, I'm doing this and just showing this to show that it isn't something that just came about because you just heard about it on a commercial or a friend was playing Pokemon the other year. But it's interesting that from 1968 to 2017, which we have here, which is obviously 2020, who would have thought that in 1968, 74, 92, 92, 94, 2000, 2013, 14, so on and so forth, that the thing that would usher in augmented reality was Pokemon. That's fascinating. That's the biggest consumer gift for augmented reality that's ever happened. And that's how most people came into interaction, whether they knew it or not. If you interacted with Pokemon, you've interacted with augmented reality. Now, when you think about the subject of augmented reality, a lot of companies, a lot of major tech companies have decided to toss their hat in the ring when it comes to AR as opposed to VR. Why? Because they're thinking about accessibility and what type of access do they have readily available to reach the consumers the fastest. That would be AR because we all carry, for the very most part, kids, youth, our senior communities, they all carry telephones or what we call the smartphone, the mobile phone. Now from 2007, September, when the iPhone first came out, all the way till now, the adoption has gone well into the billions when it comes to mobile phones and mobile devices. That means the devices and the capability and the power is already there. The greatest leap that we've experienced within the last decade from 2010 to 2020, when it comes to technology, the most significant impact that we have seen is communication. And if you consider where we're at today, contemporary our time, when it has to do with COVID, if you will, which we're going to touch on, if you look at that, if we didn't have the type of communication platforms that we have right now before us, distributed before us, that we're using and intercepting it every single day and even this moment, if COVID had hit in 2007 and 2008, this wouldn't be happening right now. But the leaps have been so significant that now AR is ready to attach itself to the communication apparatus of society but it definitely has its fair share of hindrance, especially now. It already had its fair share of hindrance, but even now more, even though it's growing, we still have a lot of obstacles, but there's more faith and confidence when you look at AR as opposed to VR right now. If you think about the active install base of augmented reality, it's substantial compared to VR. Right now, roughly around the world, you have about 26 million deployed headsets for VR. Versus AR users, you're at about 900 million users right now. You got a two billion, about a two billion market for VR for 2019, versus the eight to nine billion market for AR. When you look at Tim Cook of Apple, he's already gone out there on paper expressing that they have more fidelity and more of an approach for wanting to build an augmented reality and virtual reality. But that certainly doesn't miss this, this miss virtual reality uh, because personally, it's my favorite sector of XR completely and it's very appropriate for a lot of different reasons especially when you look at training education and development but we'll touch on that but just consider that we're still developing um, in this in the way of sight and visualization so with augmented reality we've taken significant leaps and bounds we're going forward but we have a lot more to go now COVID-19 the emergent era with COVID-19 in the emergent era if we look at what's happened as of late, in the beginning of this year, VR and AR were going up. People were still using Zoom and blue jeans and Hangouts and all that. Now, a lot of technology when it comes to XR that was being used and explored and experienced for, on the enterprise level, a lot of it was just fun things to do. Now what's so interesting, especially in the throes of technology as a whole, a lot of technologies that were just fun things to do have become the more necessary and prevalent technology that we adopt. And a lot of the technologies that we considered that were absolutely relevant and that were being utilized every second of the day, they have been disrupted by COVID-19. Uber, Airbnb, we can go on about how technology has shifted. Usually when we see a shift in technology, 
It's because a greater and a better technology has come and superseded to take its place, just like it's done with technology when it comes to traditional versus digital. But now we always knew that technology would disrupt itself as it has been, but we didn't expect necessarily that a pandemic would come in and disrupt the use case and the necessity of what people and the hierarchy of what people are using technology for. We were on a roll for some time, but the whole industry across the board and the whole eco-habitat has been disrupted. What is the eco-habitat? The eco-habitat is where all major emergent technologies abide, artificial intelligence, IoT, wearables, roboticism, XR, flanked by VR, AR, AI, flanked by machine learning, deep learning, IoT, really close with digital twins, wearables, and all of that sector, all of that has been changed. Some for the good and some not for the so-called good. But where does this leave XR specific right now with what we're looking at in 2020 here in May? Here's our key concerns. Supply chain disruption. I can't tell you how many people I know that have been trying to get a headset that can't get a headset. And a lot of people are gonna have a difficult time getting a headset in the near and near future. And it may last all the way into 2021. We don't know that yet. There's a lot of unknown what we don't know. That's why we can't leave too far right now. It's fascinating. Recession, depression, economic impacts forecasting. We are very much in an economic downturn. Every major significant data poll that's being out there is saying that we're gearing and hard towards a recession and a depression. We're seeing tens of thousands of people losing their jobs and getting laid off. We're seeing a ton of startups that are failed because they cannot get enough capital in to be able to go and finish off and get where they need to go to with their platforms. What they have is what they have and they're having to reach into their pockets and go for the classic bootstrap, but who has capital for bootstrap right now? It's very interesting. Brick and mortar LBE suspension, so location-based entertainment. Well, a lot of people, before they go and invest in VR headsets, they like to kick the tires before they go and spend all the money that it costs to buy a headset, which is a lot and substantial for a lot of headsets that are out there. We'll touch on that in just a moment. But brick and mortar LBE locations, they're done. Nobody has a business that's opening right now where I can go and to be able to interact, maybe in certain markets in Asia, maybe in certain markets in Europe, but certainly not here in the United States where you're looking at devices that you're having to share with one another. Yes, there are platforms out there that can go for sterilization, and those will be significant moving forward, but that's not gonna be relevant anytime seeing it for the foreseeable future as we know it. Ad spend and e-commerce. Well, these are two ways that augmented reality generates substantial revenue. Well, how does it make revenue? One, on the retail level and on the level where it comes to selling a product, people are using AR and they're making the bets and companies are making the bets that I could be able to show you my product in AR, you're gonna take a look at it, and then hopefully you'll be able to have this Nike that you're looking at, this immersive Nike that you're projecting for your phone device that looks so real, realer than the ones that you're wearing at the moment. That people are gonna like the way this shoe looks, they like the way this slipper looks, they like the way this mask looks, and they're gonna buy it and click, and then it's gonna get sold. But due to supply chain disruption, it's very interesting right now. When stores are closed, they're not necessarily going to be engaging and methodologies that may not or may not have certainty as opposed to others when it comes to classic ad spend. When it comes to ad spend, a lot of companies don't have a way to be able to create enough supplies to be able to enter into the supply chain for distribution, so they're cutting back on ads. So ads have been cut back dramatically. In fact, if you've been looking around in various different social platforms or in your Google search, you're probably seeing a variety of different ads that are being pushed on you than what you're accustomed to doing because now it's come to what's essential and what's non-essential. And so we're starting to see that manifested before our very eyes, and that has significantly made serious impact when it comes to XR. But what are the other things that we're looking at with XR when it comes to concerns? Well, understanding the problem. Let's jump into lack of eco-culture. Now, eco-culture is in its very rudimentary level. I know a lot of us here have probably heard of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. But when we look at eco-culture, Ecoculture is human characteristics that are permeated in and throughout technological ecosystems. In other words, oftentimes when I'm walking around Silicon Valley or going around talking to different places in the world, you often hear, and I'm not the only one here, 
that hears people talking referring to ecosystems, ecosystem this, ecosystem that. And you tend to think that ecosystems is all digital and it's a bunch of wires and sprockets and hardware and headsets and keyboards and screens and all of that. And you think about it as a software or SaaS or something like that. But an ecosystem, an ecosystem is really people full of color, gender, and native culture, or it's completely homogenous for the very most part. That's part of the big problem that we're looking and dealing with here in Silicon Valley. Because the more culture that you have in an ecosystem, the stronger and more efficient that ecosystem performs, behaves, and is. Now, how can you have an ecosystem full of people that come from the same background and all look the same and expect to build a product and market to a world that does not look like them, that does not come from them? In other words, it's far important and pertinent to consider that you need to hire the people that you want to buy your product. That will have for better, greater opportunity for higher sales and distribution. Even Apple, as great as it is, and as low as its numbers end when it comes to gender, and as low as its number when it comes to color, even Apple can do significantly better when they choose to decide to go about incorporating more eco-culture, which we can talk about pipelines, we can talk about getting people hired and that whole process, but we're just not afforded that type of time today. But it's really important that we consider adding in inclusion and culture. Now devices, more people need devices. Now if you only have 26 million devices roughly in VR headsets that have been distributed, that certainly doesn't cover the populace of the seven billion inhabitants on Earth's face. Affordability has been a big issue. No one's going out to buy $2,500 headsets. Yes, Oculus Quest, I do commend them. They have made headsets more affordable, less than $500. They've done a really good job with that. I think it needs to come down a little bit lower. But at least this is the first time that we've seen within the last two years. Now, now this is why I say one of the reasons that VR has just developed site, because in the last 24 months, this is when these headsets have come out. But there's not enough for distribution. There's not enough for affordability because everybody's price points and budgets, even in 2019, when things were so-called on the upswing, people still had a hard time affording that, especially here in California, where a house costs over a million dollars for 1,500 square feet. Did not get you started on that. Now, availability, that's another thing. COVID-19 has disrupted the supply chain. Manufacturing, it's iffy. Maybe they're building a date, maybe not. People are starting up manufacturing or factories. When there's an outbreak that happens, they have to shut that down. What do new distribution patterns and cycles look like? How do we get accessibility? This is another compelling reason for AR versus VR. And it certainly isn't an AR versus VR, but it's still compelling because you have the device already when you have AR. There's a lot more distribution when it comes to devices, when it comes to that, as opposed to virtual reality. And then accessibility. Now, you think when you're building out a headset and when you put it on that anybody, one size fits all, that's simply not the case. If I have a really big head, like me, or if somebody has a lot of hair on their head, right? or if we're thinking about those in our disabled community that may have a hard time being able to use the headset as a whole, those are things that definitely have to be taken in more consideration. Those are some of the things that we're looking at with the CyberXR community that I'm part of with our coalition, but we have a lot of new information coming out next week on best practices and standards on safety, cybersecurity, child safety, when it comes to a lot of other things uh, that we're looking at, sexual misconduct, dealing with implicit and explicit biases. We were going to VR constructs, and I go into a VR construct because I'm invited to a social platform, and I go in there and the avatars that are only available to me as a white and a white male and a white female, it begs the question, am I in the right place? We have to do better. We must do better. And so we're looking at challenging these companies and inspiring them to do better and not supporting these platforms that certainly don't seem to want to have people that look like me in there. Content, more content. 
now that the headsets are here, now that the mobile devices are here, the content focus right now, entertainment, people want more entertainment now more than ever. They're not going to the local theater, nobody's going to Broadway, and nobody went to Broadway or to a live concert last night. How do we be able to be able to scale and enhance entertainment? Travis Scott, that was a huge hit. Fortnite, congratulations, you guys rocked it. We need more of that. Manufacturing, manufacturing for training, so that when people do go into environments where it does come to training, that they'll be able to have technology to be able to help lead them way. As a, and that really helps with social distancing as well. Gosh, we're gonna to touch on that. And then we have retail, clinical, and then training. So the problem is, is that we have a deficiency of, of content, but, a lot of people are going to be looking at content development and saying, do I really want to take all the capital all the time it is to build out this content if adoption is going to be low or accessibility is going to be low? How do we generate revenue in this COVID-19 era? There's ways to do it, but a lot of that is still uncertain. Essential development. Now that we've heard of what's coming down when it comes to the coronavirus and COVID-19, we've heard of this term called essential businesses. Well, that has given us a better indicator on what this essential development should look like and where we should be focusing when it comes to emerging technologies as a whole, not just with XR. Supply chains, you're going to expect to see a lot more emerging technologies come out when it comes to supply chains and when it comes to distribution, product distribution, expect to see a lot more robots with roboticism. I know a lot of roboticists that are building hard right now when it comes to robots for supply chain fulfillment. You're looking at product distribution. You're looking at drone deliveries. You're looking at autonomous deliveries for people inside cars. That may have seemed like a luxury idea and as a slow flow, expect to see a lot more autonomy uh, happening when it comes to robots, when it comes to drone piling, when it comes to deliveries. You're gonna see a lot more of that. The, be able to reduce human contact. That's gonna be a very big deal coming up. We're gonna to touch on that just a little bit. Medical training, social distance learning for education, that is huge. It was big already, but now it's skyrocket huge because now we need to be able to find a way to teach adults and children ways to be able to train them without having to necessarily train with one another, but to be able to train with uh, uh, digital beings, if you will, in digital environments and constructs. That's happening now. That's not just an ideal or a dream. We see a lot of manufacturing AR, which is a big part of augmented reality as well, helping with training. And platforms such as the HoloLens, very expensive, but platforms such as the HoloLens allows people to accelerate their training uh, acumen, if you will, uh, much quicker than if someone's hovering over your shoulder, breathing down your neck trying to teach you how to construct or put together uh, an engine or a motor. And at the same time, on the medical and then the surgical theater, we have the self-same thing where they have the capability of being able to train, make mistakes, be nervous, and not have to sacrifice someone's health for being nervous and not necessarily having to deal with the physical uh, uh, and tangible cadaver. Now, let me say this about content creation because this is really important under the banner of XR. The fidelity has to be right. The experience has to be right. A lot of content that comes out there doesn't reach the benchmark. Well, the benchmark is what we call high fidelity. Physiological, psychological fidelity, environmental, contextual fidelity. It has, there's no reason to go from one existence of training to the other if it's not compelling enough and that you're actually not learning in it. If you go into an environment and it's uncanny, people will have more of an awe of the environment that they're trying to understand that they just went in than the actual subject at hand. Good content delivers good training. That means good visualization in the art side. That means getting information from the experts. If I'm in a room, although I'm a so-called expert in XR, and if I'm in a room full of teachers and we're talking about building an educational platform, I'm no longer the expert. The expert is the teacher. Because what we have to do as technologists is extract that information from the teacher or from the expert and get that and then digitize that based on what we know and what we build. So I'm looking at right now for products and platforms that bring along other people in the sector that they're looking to build for. Because if I'm in a room full of four dudes that are trying to develop a training platform or anyone, and it's just four developers. No wonder your product is failing when you go to market. 
because you didn't build it with other people's expertise and consideration in mind. That's critically important. Agritech, that's gonna be huge. Look what's happened to our food. You can't even barely get a steak nowadays. And if you are, you're paying a lot or you're limited. So look for ways for tech to be able to grow and be able to go not just farm to table, but farm to door pipeline development so that people can get food and not waste all the supplies. A lot of things, see, we have to consider that with this move with COVID-19 and what's happened with COVID-19, a lot of things have changed even sometimes for the better because it's one big test subject. If there was a vaccine tomorrow, we will not completely go back to business as usual as a nation or as a world because a lot of people have now realized there's a lot more that they can actually accomplish from their homes than they were going through a two to three hour commute going back and forth and having to go and tangle in those type of environments. There's a lot more that could be done with technology where it was a nice luxury to have to realize that, hey, you're subjected to that now, and now it's become a great benefit to be able to help you get along your way. So just know that emerging technologies are here. They've now been more adopted than they ever have been before, and it will continue to be the case. COVID or not. Points of interest, 2020, 2021. In virtuality, a rise of consumer content, you will see it. Higher enterprise adoption, they are going to be able to find out ways to be able to deal with this, with what's happening in contemporary to our time. Education and training, you're going to see a lot more distant learning platforms and apps come out. A lot of them aren't great, to be candid. I think they have a lot of work to do. You're going to see a lot of fool's gold, a lot of snake oil products out there. I recommend people that have an interest or have a desire to build an education and training, that would be one of the highlightable areas that I would focus on if I were to get into the startup circuit to be able to build. Education and training is huge. I know a lot of people that have really awesome training platforms that they're building, uh, both men and women, that are founders that are doing an incredible job and have some incredible contribution to be able to offer society. And I think they'll do quite well here soon. Digital twins to be able to create a physical environment and translate that into a digital environment. Our phones are getting that type of technology involved in it that will allow us to be able to do that with time of flight being added in the iPad. You'll have them in your phone and other things that you're going to see come down the pipeline. Events, 2D. Now, I specifically said 2D because a lot of people are putting out their events that are 3D events and animation, cartoon characters. Now, I, if that's the way that you want to go and if that's what your idea of virtuality is, I'm happy for you. But nobody wants to walk around in an 8 to 10 hour conference with a big old headset on their head that starts to feel like a stone on top of their head visually to walk around and communicate with one another. 2D, I think people are still trying to attempting to wrap their mind around it. It doesn't mean that we can't socially congregate in 3D spaces, we can, and we should if we have the opportunity and the devices to do it. But again, if no one, not everyone has the device to be able to get that, it's really awkward coming to the party, especially when you're looking at little animated figures. I much prefer to be able to take an image of myself and other people and to be able to 3D render that and the human eye resolution experiences to where I can look and put on my headset or use AR and look and completely, almost indiscernibly, cannot tell the difference between the real thing and the unreal thing. That's a really big deal when we start talking about perception and physiological and psychological fidelity. That's huge. I think 2D is a great start. I think 3D needs a lot more refinement, a lot. But, but it still has some play. But a lot of what I'm seeing out there, I'm not impressed we can do better. Augmented reality, retail AR, now that people can't do as much shopping or curbside pickup, you can't just go in there and throw on some Adidas and some Pumas and walk around. Those days aren't happening right now, and it's very uncertain if they're going to happen soon. It may happen, it may not. What if this thing comes back again? What if it morphs into something else? Retail AR, expect to see a lot of that. What does that Star Wars t-shirt look like on me? What does that blouse or that top look like on me, right? There you go. What does that hat look like? What does that puff coat or beanie? Manufacturing training, you're going to see a lot of that happening because that, be able to, that is going to be able to help us to, uh, to reduce peer-to-peer uh, 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 -peer impact in close environments you know, and be able to help us sustain uh, social distancing. Medical applications, you're going to see a lot of things happen uh, in the medical sector because we need to give as much help as we can to the front line as possible. These are things that we're seeing, but I expect to see a lot more with that. There's much more that we can talk about on that and just talk about that for hours, if you will. 
2021 in VR, greater accessibility. Now they're keeping more, hopefully, uh, with organizations such as CyberXR Coalition and others. They're going to be holding uh, platforms accountable for greater accessibility and working on a vendor level and a partner level and helping inspire them to do more uh, when it comes to accessibility so that everyone can have access to this technology, not just for the fun of it. It's not just a feel good initiative, but culture and accessibility is a revenue driver. The more people that have access, the more people that feel comfortable, the more identifiable your product becomes to other people that are willing to spend capital with you. We need to get out of this mindset of first drive diversity where it's a feel good initiative and leap on into the second drive of DNI when it comes to looking at DNI as a revenue driver. That's real. Now we have social distancing suites. You never thought that you would see a whole sector or a whole section of apps that are dedicated for social distancing, but you will see that. I believe that you'll be seeing that Q3 and Q4 if you already haven't started to see some apps that are dedicated specifically purpose to that. And then augmented reality, AR glasses, consumer 5G power. When you have 5G power, you can do more things. Remember, the more power that you have, the more devices and newer devices that you're going to see that were intentionalized decades ago. So when it comes to Apple in particular, I believe that you'll start to see AR glasses on the Apple side of things that are late 2021 or well into 2022. But how much does this, how much sense does it make to put on to put out a new product like that when supply chains are disrupted? They may have been well on their way, but that's just not the case now. We don't know what distribution looks like. Apple is trying to wrap their minds around that right now. If Apple's trying to wrap their minds around that, so many other people are. In closing, one of the things I talk about is build together. When we talk about build together and come together, because now is the time to do it. And I go back to a story all the way back to 2008, an article that came out in the New York Times. And this article talked about it was the startup revolution when you saw a lot of people quitting their jobs or have gotten or got lost their jobs in the Great Recession. Remember, iPhone came out the year before the Great Recession, and all of a sudden you see all these people that have no jobs, but they had a lot of ideas for tech. Tech became incredibly wealthy and amassed a ton of wealth overnight. And so the article said that a lot of people didn't have confidence in going back to their jobs because they didn't have confidence in leadership. It was, it was an environment, and they realized that they weren't in the time of their parents or grandparents, where their grandparents and parents stayed at jobs for 10 to 30 years. Those days have come and gone. So they said, I'd rather be able to rely on my own business acumen. And so they found other like-minded people. They're around the table. You over there, how much do you have? I have 25 cents. Sue, how much do you have? I have a dollar. Bill, what do you got? I got 75 cents. And Peggy, LaShonda, what do you got? We got $5 each. They put their money on the table, they had really good ideas, and they began to build out their startup. And they built together. A lot of them rolled the dice just like Ponce de Leon, right? Just like Sacagawea, just like other explorers, Lewis and Clark. They're headed to an uncertain land. They rolled the dice and they landed. That's a lot like technology. Thank you so much for your time. We'll turn it over for questions. Wow. Uh, I don't even know where to begin because I have a few questions, but I am not going to start with my questions. Um, thank you, Chris. I do appreciate you taking the time to run that down. I know it's a lot of information for um, an hour and um, for folks who didn't catch everything, I will definitely uh, have the, the replay, but it looks like we have a question uh, from Brian. Um, Brian, you are available to talk. I'm going to unmute you if you want to ask your question. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. I'm a fantastic presentation, by the way. Uh, super informative. Uh, a lot of questions was answered in the presentation, but I do have one. Um, has an African-American creator, uh, content provider, how do we marry the content to the technology? Because there's a lot of technology out there in VR and XR but there's not a lot of content. And there's a huge gap between uh, the creator-owned content and the technology. Everybody has technology, but not a lot of people have content. So how do we close that gap between uh, XR technology and systems and the content that's gonna be needed to drive the technology? I think that's a good question. And thank you for sharing that, Brian. I think 
speaking to that, and you're absolutely right, there is a huge deficit when it comes to content. I think a big part of that has to do with taking a look around and looking at reality. You know, one of the things I always and often talk about that, if you're going to extend reality, then you must bring reality with it. And so a lot of times when we think about virtual reality or even augmented reality, we tend to take things that are fictitious and that aren't real, and we look to bring that over and say, okay, this is, this is what we're looking, but extended reality is just that. It's an extension or a byproduct of reality itself digitally. And so for bringing that over, when it comes to specific culture content, I think the best approach is to be able to take from the culture narrative, uh, whether from where you come from or from where other people come from, and how do I take this realistic environment and then pictorially or digitally illustrate that in a digital environment so that other people, one, can identify what that looks like, what it feels like, sounds like, what it breathes like, what it tastes like, and to be able to bring that into for relatable audiences. Now, finding those that would be able to fund such initiatives are thin and hard because, to be candid, a lot of people, there's a lot, a lot of underrepresented communities out there, specifically Black, that have fantastic ideas, right. wonderful ideas, but aren't given the time a day on the VC route for funding and the seed Absolutely. route for funding. It's piss poor to be candid that you have so many black technologists that have wonderful, I see it. I've been all, I, I see it all the time and they can't get funding, but the projects that I do see funded that do get out there, they don't look like me. They don't look like Dennis. And so I think that, but now, but when you look at the, if you look at the benchmark, if you look at the content that has been put out there, especially that has a lot to do with black and color, I'll use one of the best examples that are more colloquial to us, the day, the day that the comic industry decided to create a platform or a venue or a film called Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Is the biggest film that they ever got involved with for Marvel. Mm -hmm. They rolled the dice and they landed. Right. If I'm them, when it comes to building technology, I would bet on black. I would bet on genders. I would bet on something that's mm -hmm. far different from what we've been betting on all this time as a collective. I think it's necessary because if they don't do that, especially here in the United States, if you don't decide if you want to continue to exclude it's gonna to lead to the demise and the failure Absolutely. of technology as a whole, and then other markets globally will supersede the local American market. So make a decision. Either everybody works and everybody eats the pie, or nobody eventually will. Guarantee that. Yeah, and there's definitely um, market studies that show that diversity will increase um, the, um, uh, the product productivity and the market value of your company. So it's in the uh, corporate uh, best interests of most of these companies to be diverse and inclusive. And incidentally, we do have another webinar uh, next month uh, where we're going to be talking with some uh, VCs, um, folks from Republic and Awesome, um, which is uh, a black-headed um, venture capital firm. So if you want to find out more about that and how to get funded, um, you know, come back. We'll have more on that. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, the next one is, what's the best way to mon monetize AR right now as a creator? I think when you look at AR and augmented reality and, and monetizing, there's not necessarily a singular way to monetize. Sure, you can look at the ad revenue side of things, but you can build an ad and it really adopts from the virtual or from the app uh, point of view where we have apps and dynamic ad rotation and say, okay, I'm going to create a platform, curate it and get a lot of users and a lot of adopters. And then I'm going to put in rotating ads and make deals with ad makers and say, okay, boom, there, I'm selling ads. Then there's the retail level, which is unsure that I spoke about earlier because you don't necessarily know what the supply chain looks like. I think with AR, I think AR retail is huge. I think AR manufacturing on the enterprise level for adoption, if I'm gonna build an AR product right now, if I'm doing it for mass consumer, I'm gonna do something in retail. If I'm gonna do it for non-mass consumer, then I'm gonna do something that has to do with manufacturing, 
something that has to do with the medical industry, which is huge for a number of reasons. It's something that has to do with training and education. I firmly believe this, that if I'm gonna roll, if I'm gonna roll the dice on that, I think education and training are the better and the biggest ways to go. It's part of what we're doing uh, with Flotilla, but I know a lot of people, and some people that are actually here on this conference that have training platforms that are one click away from having a lot of success. Some are on the VR sector, but in the AR sector, retail is your friend, training and education is your friend for monetizing. All right, good deal. All right, next one. Is there an entity in the black technology space to pilot projects or ideas? Does it make sense to create an organization that does this? I think that's a really good question. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. I don't think I've heard of one. I, I know that there are some accelerators out there. I don't know if there's any rapid prototype type organizations. What are your thoughts? Do you know? From lab to funding and lab to market, there is none out there of note. I know there's people that have tried and, and there's probably some that are so under the radar that are out there. I mean no disrespect to them. I just don't know that you exist. But <laughs> even if they do exist, go and ex exercise and enjoy your autonomy. You need to be building that. Look, I'll say this. I've said it before. I, I am no longer satisfied, although I think it's a cool thing, but I'm no longer satisfied for people that look like me in particular and look like you, Dennis, to get a job at Google or Apple. I will be more satisfied when people that look like us create the next Google and Apple. I think that's really important to exercise autonomy. And if there's none out there that exist, to the person that asked that question, be the person that builds it. No matter the color, no matter the gender, be the person that builds it. I think it's a great opportunity, especially now. A lot of people have lost their jobs and they're not going back. They're not going back and they're going, oh, you know, I think I'm going to school. California, CSU, California State University, the biggest university system on the planet just said, we're going digital in August. A lot of people may not be able to go to school and to be able to enjoy such things and opportunities where we lose a job, say, I think I'm going back to school. Those days may be done. Yeah. Entrepreneurship is key. Go ahead. Uh, next question. What are some of the security, privacy, and social issues? Um, within AR and VR? I think there's a lot. I think just from me being around the cybersecurity community, hearing a lot of the things that are happening, you know, I have a, a, very, a very close uh, colleague of mine that, you know, comes from a very well-known university, you know, somebody Zoom bombed that, you know, and was very, uh, a racist tirade from my understanding. And how did that person get in, right? So now we're talking about just someone just easily just slip in uh, and to be able to cause such a ruckus for such an event that uh, is very important uh, to her and to their organization and to the whole university. When you start thinking about cybersecurity as a threat when it comes to VR and AR, we don't necessarily know all the ramifications from the non-protect. Look, Zoom didn't, ex Zoom was happy. Zoom was content with 10 million users a day. Now they've gone to 200 million users they can't even wrap their minds around that. They didn't see that coming down the pipeline. A lot of us have been using Zoom and all that for years and for some time, but I've seen more of the inside of people's living rooms in the last three weeks <laughs> than I have in the last three years. And you start to wonder, what does that look like? What type of person am I really in this meeting of, with a big congregated spaces? What type of predators are out there? What type of hackers, bad hackers that are out there that are gonna access my information digitally? So I think the biggest threat right now for when it comes to VR and cybersecurity and AR and cybersecurity isn't necessarily something that's hackable, but I think the biggest threat is sexual misconduct. And I think the biggest threat is implicit and explicit biases. Mm, yeah, I, I, I'd have to agree. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. This one is, how does one break into XR, AR, VR field, or is right now not a good time for that? Being an entrepreneur is hard. If anyone tells you elsewise, it's a liar. It's one of the most hardest and difficult things you can do in the pathogens of work is go an uncertain way, especially 
especially when you're building and developing emergent technologies. There's no blueprint. If I want to start a bank, I've got centuries of information that I could go to. This is how you start a bank. If I want to start a restaurant, I have a ton of information on how to do that. Nowadays, if I want to start an app, there's a blueprint, there's a roadmap. But somebody had to pay the sacrifice and the trough of disillusionment to lead to the slope of enlightenment onto a plateau of productivity. So to be able to start off in emerging technology as an entrepreneur is one, so you mentally have to have the mental mindset to deal with that. Now, if you're a person of color or a woman, now you have a lot more to go with because now you've got to deal with the thicket of bias that you will come in contact with. Is it a good time now to start a startup in XR in the COVID-19 era? Absolutely. I absolutely think so. I absolutely think now is the best time. Why? Because you may find yourself in a situation where you're going to lose your job or you're going to be a thousand to two thousand people getting a job. Look, already in 2019, I'll be done because I know the time. Then already in 2019, you had a thousand applicants per job in Silicon Valley. A thousand. 750 is white, homogenous male, 250 Asian, Latin, and black. You had a 1% chance of getting a phone interview and 1.5% chance of getting an actual interview. The odds are stacked against you. Now, do you go for it as an entrepreneur if you have the heart to do it, the, 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 the tenacity, the acumen, the drive? Do it. But here's what I would lend to you. Don't do it alone. Part of the doctrine of how I do business is built on, build together. It sucks and it's hard to do it alone. It's almost impossible to do it alone. But if you do it together, you have a better shot at getting it. And the comrades that you trek with know, and you better know that they're with you all the way. Everyone in, all skin in. Now, I'll say this in closing. I'm really appreciative to have had this opportunity to spend with you guys. Dennis, continue to drive the New York sector. There's a lot of things happening in the East Coast, just like in the West Coast. But I know you guys have got to you know, hit pretty hard. I hope the very best for everybody that's on here. I encourage you to continue to do what you're doing. If you're an entrepreneur or if you're a observer or if you came out just to get a little something extra today, I definitely doff my hat, salute everything that you guys are doing in business. And if I can be a help to any of you guys in what you're doing, your endeavors, I'm more than happy to be here. Stand strong, endure, be safe, wash your hands. And to go help others where you can help them in business with something that you may have picked up today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. I definitely appreciate it. And I'm sure if everybody's mics were on, you'd hear them. Thank you as well. <laughs> um, I do want to also say that this is going to be online probably by the end of day Friday uh, on YouTube. You can visit NYC, uh, excuse me, um, bitnyc.org for the um, link. And I'll send out a follow-up to this presentation with uh, details and a survey for feedback. So uh, thank you all again. I appreciate the time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, Chris. See you guys. Be good.